In this video, we're going to take a look at Go generics from an architectural perspective. This video is also in article form and there's a link to that in the description below. In my opinion, generics is one of the most fundamental features of a statically typed language. And I have to say that Go has made some great improvements to generics since the proposals began. That being said, Go has still missed some crucial aspects in the design and I am unfortunately left unsatisfied with the final solution. I had started making this video almost two years ago now and I have decided to finally finish it as the long-awaited Go Generics has finally been released. As relieved as I am with some of the well-needed advancements, I find it rather disheartening that it was released in its current state. By the way, if you haven't yet introduced yourself to the concept of generics, I highly recommend you do so before watching the rest of this video. Also, the opinions expressed in this video are not limited to the Go programming language. Before I go any further, it's important to clarify the goal of generics so that we're on the same page. Generics can mean different things to different people and when we use a generic term like generics, it may be unclear what we are referring to. The core objective of generics is to allow programmers to opt in to a form of type checking safety that can ensure that two or more variables share the same implementation of a specific interface type. That way we can work with operations that take in two or more of the same type or that return a matching type, such as goes built in numerical operations. Generics in turn may offer some additional benefits, namely optimization and reduced code duplication, but this cannot be sought directly at the expense of the core idea, but rather as a natural consequence. Go's official generics tutorial describes generics as a way to declare or use functions or types that are written to work with any set of types. What a meaningless explanation of generics. If that was generics' sole purpose, then that is exactly what interfaces are designed for. As a matter of fact, generics require interfaces to function. This description does not capture the added functionality envisaged for generics. Specifically, generics allow us to specify in a function signature or interface that two or more interface types must share the same concrete implementation in order to allow for operations that require matching implementations or that return a matching implementation. It's quite shocking that this isn't the first thing mentioned. Some argue that the sole purpose of generics is to reduce code duplication. However, this type of code duplication is due to a failure to depend on abstractions, and that's what interfaces are meant to solve. Rather, generics is solving a limitation with interfaces where we cannot define a restriction for the implementation of two interface values to be the same. This limitation prevents us from using interfaces in certain scenarios, which would have otherwise allowed us to depend on abstractions rather than copying and pasting code for various implementations. So, it is the interfaces that are helping with reduced code duplication, and it is more in the indirect sense that generics makes a difference here. Generics works together with the existing functionality of interfaces to achieve this goal, and it could have come under the one package of interfaces from the get-go without even needing to give it a special name. It's solving a limitation with interfaces that shouldn't have been there in the first place. I feel it's worth drumming in this opinion. Now, let's move on to the meat of this video. Let's take a look at the flaws of Go generics. The first flaw is that Go allows generic types to be created that are only used once, contradicting the purpose of generics to allow two or more interface types to share the same implementation. If there is only one usage of the generic type, then the type isn't sharing its implementation with another type, making it redundant. For example, the functionality of the following two snippets of code is equivalent, since the use of generics does not offer any added functionality. Because of this, I propose that there should be at minimum a compile time warning, or possibly even an error, when using generics in this way, similar to how Go refuses to compile when an imported module is unused. However, the statement I just made is surprisingly controversial. Some argue that although the code is the same in functionality, it may be implemented differently under the hood and offer different performance characteristics. A common expectation is that the first will be templated such that the compiler will produce a separate print implementation for each type, something which offers increased runtime performance at the cost of a potentially larger binary. 
The second would always be achieved using runtime polymorphism. This is a legacy artifact of how generics work in the likes of C++, where generics occurs if and only if templating occurs, which is not seen in more modern languages such as Java and TypeScript, where type erasure takes place at compile time. It would be disgraceful to see Go take the strategy of mixing together templating and generics rather than separating them into two distinct concepts. A quote from the issues page summarises this well. Ideally, both of the above variants would compile to the same machine code. It would be sad if people started littering their code with, from a type checking perspective unnecessary, type parameters, solely for perceived performance reasons. End quote. There is no reason why generics should act as a compiler hint for templating, and there is no reason why the lack of generics should act as a compiler hint to use runtime polymorphism either. The optimization strategies used should be abstracted away from the programmer and shouldn't be influenced by the fact that they are simply trying to incorporate additional type safety into their interfaces, similar to how the act of inlining is also a compiler detail. Either the compiler should make an attempt to decide on its own which strategy is most appropriate to the situation, regardless of whether the arbitrary concept of generics is used, or a separate language feature should be implemented to give the programmer more control. I have devised a hypothetical proposal for the latter which I will show at the end of this video. Luckily, Go could alter its decision for this down the road without affecting the backwards compatibility of the syntax and functionality of existing Go code, although it would have been nice to have this fleshed out from the beginning. The second flaw is to do with built-in operations and how they do not implement traditional interfaces. So Go has taken quite a disappointing stance on how to incorporate built-in operations into generics. Imagine a version of Go that didn't provide custom operators and instead implemented basic operations using functions. Numerical operations might have then looked something like this, where we say a dot add b instead of a plus b. These operations could then be defined using a traditional interface type, which would immediately make them usable with generics. The following code shows what such an adder interface might look like. Since the fundamental operations in Go are not implemented as methods, you must instead define an adder interface like so, listing out all the concrete implementations of the interface. This system has two flaws. Firstly, the interface is defined by a set of implementations rather than an actual interface preventing new implementations from coming along unless you add them manually to the existing interface. This goes against the fundamental architectural purpose of interfaces. Go has tried to mitigate this annoyance by introducing some built-in and standard library interfaces, such as constraints.integer, so you don't have to worry about populating these type lists. But unfortunately, these interfaces only include built-in types. The second problem with this system is that you can't even add in your own implementations. This is because Go does not have operator overloading, meaning no custom types can in any way satisfy these operations. Instead, one must create another set of interfaces that use methods to represent these operations instead, and then wrap all the basic types into versions that implement these methods. This would be very tedious, and also it means it would be considered bad practice to use any of Go's newly provided built-in interfaces, since they are not future-proof like the method version. I can understand the decision not to introduce operator overloading to the language. Because of that, I would propose that the built-in interfaces instead use methods to represent these operations. Then, the basic types should natively implement these interfaces, making A plus B replaceable with A dot add B. That way, new types could implement these operations, but users of the operation interfaces would be faced with having to type a dot add b instead of a plus b. This would be a reasonable compromise in my opinion, especially since many of the implementations could be custom types anyway, such as vectors or matrices, where operation names would have to be spelled out regardless. The third and final flaw is the lack of self-referencing generics. The custom adder interface I proposed earlier has a severe limitation. The generic T is only used in the function arguments and the return value. However, there is no way to require the receiver, the implementer of the interface, to also be of type T. 
This makes generics unusable for many of its critical use cases. Any custom operations or even wrapping the built-in operations cannot be done elegantly. A potential way Go could introduce this possibility is with a special self-generic. This could perhaps be exposed implicitly without the need for adding it to the type parameter list manually, but I have decided to include this type parameter in the example syntax that is shown. Without this functionality, we would be forced to implement such an interface like so. A single manager instance would have to be passed through your codebase for each combination of operation and type. This would obviously be quite disastrous and I'd hate to see this start happening. So that's the end of the three critical flaws I have identified in Go's generic solution. Earlier on in the video, I said I'd give an idea for how templating hints could be implemented in Go if so desired. Of course, Go generally leaves these details up to the compiler to optimize, so instead think of the following as an idea that could be implemented by any programming language if such low-level control is desired. It generally makes more sense to do templating, that is compile time code duplication, at the call site rather than in the interface of a function. A hint to template a particular parameter could be indicated using angle bracket notation. This could also be extended to the particular value using double bracket notation. So here you can see an example on the left and this would end up compiling to something like what you can see on the right. So in the first case we template the function based on the type of the parameter passed in and in the second case we template directly based on the value. So similarly inwards facing angle bracket notation could be used to suggest to the compiler not to perform any templating and instead stick with runtime polymorphism. This would allow you to override any potential compiler optimization. These notations could also be used within function signatures to indicate a preference but with the option to be overridden at the call site if desired. It should generally be avoided within interfaces since different implementations should be able to have control over their optimization strategy. A mandatory act of templating may also be desired in particular circumstances. For example, you might want to create a fixed size stack object that must insist on templating the length value. That way the implementation has access to this length value as a compile time constant and can thus use it to build a statically sized array. The mandatory nature of this templating could perhaps be indicated with an exclamation mark before the angle brackets. So this is the type of strategy I would suggest Go to take if they do want to give the programmer control over templating. This is similar to a solution I have devised for my own programming language. However, I don't expect Go would do this due to the added complexity involved for the programmer, similar to how you can't control the inlining of functions. It will probably be left to the compiler to optimize, in which case I dearly hope that the compiler's decision isn't influenced by the use or non-use of generics, especially singly occurring generics. Instead, it should be able to make smart optimization decisions either way. So, to conclude, it seems that Go still has a long way to go before generics can reach a satisfactory state. Let's hope that the things I've mentioned in this video are picked up and at least considered. However, I originally wrote the article for this video before generics were released and at this stage they are already released, so there's not that much more that can be done. Regardless, it is still a great achievement to see generics released in its current form and I'm looking forward to trying it out. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this very opinionated video in the comments below. So don't forget you can check out the article form of this video in the description below if you prefer. So thank you for watching and special thanks to the Patreon supporters who help make these videos possible.